organization. Uh, we are, I just want to be clear, we're not representatives of MOC, the Metropolitan Authority of West, Westmoreland County. Uh, municipal Authority. We, we are uh, with, a non, with a nonprofit that studies uh, clean air and water issues, and we are one of several groups that worked on this presentation for you today, and I'm going to pass the mic to our friends. Hi, I'm Koa, and this is Hannah. We're from Three Rivers Waterkeeper. We are a water-based environmental nonprofit in southwestern PA, and we are a legal and environmental advocate for the community, and we're excited to be presenting to you today. Okay. Maybe we'll get started. Oh, yeah. Please feel free to fill in here. We've got spare chairs also. So today we'll be going over... Um, First, the impact of droughts on the region. Secondly, the way MOC works and the way it, uh, it, it, it the way fracking impacts your drinking water. Thirdly, uh, water conservation orders from MOC. And fourthly, how you can contact your water authority. Uh, we'd like for folks to be kind and courteous to each other. There will be a section at the end. Um, we want there to be an opportunity for dialogue. I know many of you expressed concerns to us and we want there to be a chance for you to talk to each other. There's no wrong opinions to have in this room. Um, so when if, if you're voicing uh, an opinion that is in disagreement with somebody else, uh, you can debate their ideas, but please don't call them names and please make sure everybody gets a chance to speak. So you know if you've spoken three or four times, maybe it's time for somebody else to get the mic. Um, and uh, with that out of the way, I'm going to pass the mic to this is your turn. Yeah. And you just need to speak up. Okay. Oh, yeah. So the mic doesn't project sound. It's just for the recording so we can get good sound of the recording. So if you didn't hear something tonight, um, you, there's still some seats in the front if you're having trouble hearing. Um, and also, we're going to have a recording so you can look back on this later. Okay. Um, so that, that's what the mic is for so we can hear it in the recording and be able to listen to it later. Okay. All right. All right, everyone. Hi. Also, I wanted to throw out there, I actually grew up out here. I graduated from Kiski area in 2013, and uh, this is near and dear to my heart. So I'm happy to see so many people showing up. We wanted to do a, a quick cover, quickly cover um, the background of what's been going on and give you guys some terms. I'm going to pass the mic to Koa just because we're going back and forth. But yeah, so a little bit of background to hopefully kind of like put some context on all of this. So what is a watershed? A watershed is an area of land where precipitation being rain and snow um, will go into creeks and streams and larger rivers and eventually to outflow points like the ocean or bays or what we're talking about today, a reservoir. And then I'm going to talk about uh, weather droughts. So what is a weather drought? A drought is a deficiency in precipitation over an extended period of time. This is usually longer than a season that results in water shortage that can cause adverse effects to the environment and the people in the community. And the way that droughts impact reservoirs is there's not enough precipitation in a watershed to fill a collection area like the Beaver Run Reservoir. And the water levels in the area can deplete and get to extremely low levels, and that's what we're seeing in this situation. And I think it's important to point out that there are weather droughts, but there are also droughts due to depletion from other reasons. Um, for instance, taking water from a reservoir to the point where just precipitation cannot get it back to the level that's necessary. I keep hitting the wrong button. I'm sorry, everyone, I'm learning. So yeah, this is yeah, so um, here's a couple of maps to kind of also set the scene. So the first map we have is of Beaver Run Reservoir. A lot of you have probably seen this before, but this is kind of just like an idea of what it looks like. And it's 1,300 acres, and it lies within a 43 square mile drainage area and serves approximately 130,000 people. So this is a pretty big reservoir, so it's very important that we're focusing on this today. And the second map we have is the MAWC service area. This kind of gives you an idea. It has multiple water treatment plants, as well as in the um, highlighted blue region, you can see where the Beaver Run Reservoir actually is in the context of the larger area. So to quickly touch on uh, what we all probably already know, but we're still going to look at it, is um, you know in November, the uh, conservation order was issued. And just to kind of touch on that, it. It wasn't issued when we were current Westmoreland County was currently in a drought, but um, 
it was due to the fact that a lot of the data came from places that were outside of the 22,000 acres in the Beaver Run watershed area that are upstream of it. And so this kind of speaks to the fact that there's a lot of factors that bring in why experiencing drought and why this conservation order was issued. The um, There was a decrease of 13 inches less rain in 2022 to 2023. This information is from the conservation order. And just to note too, um, 21 and a half million gallons of water is pulled daily at the reservoir serving as the, uh, the authority's primary water source. And so there's really big numbers that are associated with this part. And so this is a figure that we got from a TRIB Live article, um, and this original source was MAWC. And this shows on the x-axis, you can see the month of year. And then on the y-axis, you can see the elevation. So that's number of feet above sea level. And the lighter line that we have shows the average. And so that's essentially all of the years leading up to 2023. And you can see that that in December um, was 1042.3 feet above sea level. And then the darker blue line we have is just 2023. And you can see in December, that's 1,033 feet above sea level, which is 9.3 feet below the reservoir's average level, which is a significant amount. And so earlier, COA touched on depletion of water supplies, and we're going to talk a bit more about that. And so when we're looking at the two factors with droughts, we're seeing a weather impact, but we're also seeing a depletion factor. And so challenges that happen when predicting why water supply levels are declining is due to the increasing occurrence and severity of droughts, changes in land use and land cover, and increased water demand. And on another level to that, water systems that are experiencing withdrawals without recharge, meaning that water does not return to the cycle, are at an even greater risk of water supply decline, which leads us to precipitation cannot meet the increasing demands of oil and gas. And if you look at this chart, it says, it basically is stating that from 2008 to 2019, you can see a steady increase of um, how much water per well is used. And so in um, 2008, it was two to seven million gallons of water used per well. And it's gone up steadily about a million gallons of water per well each year, going up to 14 to 39 million gallons of water per well in 2019. Um, this is what we, the information that we do know. We're also looking continuing to look at compiled data, self-reporting data from the different industries surrounding the reservoir. But this is what we're seeing is this trend. So we want to put into perspective uh, how much of this is currently going to heavy industry such as fracking. Um, this is the number that we got from Mach, 328 million gallons rounded up to 329. Um, now, this is being consumed by three companies. So that's Olympus, CNX, and Apex. Um, if you go by the average consumption of a household over the course of uh, a day, which is 400 gallons, multiply that into a year, you do the math, it works out to be about as much as all of the houses in Vandergrift. Um, and I want, I want that, that is about 2,250 houses. Um, and I want to put it into perspective uh, in, in another way as well, which is um, one of the major issues that we work on at Protect PT is oil and gas waste. Uh, once this once this water has been used to frack a well, um, it is contaminated with everything that was underground, including what they call tenorms, which are naturally occurring radioactive materials. Um, there are no known ways to purify this water and put it back into a watershed. So saying it's the same roughly as the houses in Vandergrift um, is even still missing part of the picture because when Vandergrift's homes are done with the water, it is able to be repurified. It is able to re-enter the watershed. It doesn't get injected deep underground. Uh, this is... Another, this is a, this is something that, a map that our environmental scientists put together. These are the daily numbers that a fracking operator is authorized to withdraw. Um, they rarely do withdraw this much, but the numbers are pretty staggering. This is in gallons. Um, so the amount that they're currently withdrawing is by no means the maximum that they could. And one other thing to consider is that in Penn Township alone, which is our home at Protect PT, 
Uh, currently, there are four wells in operation. There are eight more at various stages of permitting and construction. Um, so we're looking at adding double, and am I getting the, the, the numbers right? Yeah. Well pads. Yeah. Yeah. So there's quite a lot of multiplication that can happen here. Um, and it's something to be concerned about when we are dealing with drought. So some context over the last six months or so, um, the PA Department of Environmental Protection does declare droughts for counties and for the state. Um, they do this based on various conditions. That can trigger mock entering what they call stage one, two, or three emergencies. Stage one, two, or three emergencies can also be declared by mock based on their own uh, footage in the reservoir. This was this is a map of Pennsylvania showing conditions over 2023. Uh, as you can see, Westmoreland was in drought watch. Drought contingency plans. So Mock has a drought contingency plan. They're required to develop one. This is describing the, uh, the conditions under which uh, they will declare an emergency. It's a specific footage. So this past year in July, sorry, in June, uh, there was a, um, there was a uh, drought declared by the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, and in November, Mock issued their uh, pause on fracking withdrawals. Um, I'm very glad they did that. I think that was the responsible thing to do. Um, what concerns me is just that the drought began almost half a year prior. So now we want to talk about how do you contact Mock um, and what might you say if you're concerned about any of these issues. Um, because, as I said, you know, we're with a nonprofit, we don't represent mock. There are four principles that we think uh, they should look at. Um, we, you know, we think they're good people who are trying to do the right thing. Uh, we want them to look into these options for preserving our water for the use of the public rather than for private profit, primarily. Uh, first off, conserve what we've got. Uh, we believe that they should automatically pause fracking withdrawals whenever a drought watch or warning is declared either countywide or statewide. Now, they have, uh, like, like I said, they have automatic criteria that will trigger their conservation plan, and their conservation plan specifies that certain uses of water are what's called prohibited uses. Uh, we are asking them to add fracking withdrawals to that so that they automatically pause withdrawals anytime there is a drought. But realizing that most of the withdrawals last year did not take place during the drought, but nonetheless contributed to the lower levels, we're looking at what do you do when there is a rainy day? And it's funny, you know, normally we talk about planning for a rainy day. Now we're talking about planning for a dry day. So um, we are asking them to cap fracking withdrawals from Beaver Run Reservoir at half the amount used in 2023. We're also hoping that they can create a long-term strategic plan for water conservation. And for this, um, one of the uh, there's a couple of important things that we hope they take into account. Um, first of all, um, the science on fracking has changed tremendously over the last decade. We want to make sure they use the latest science. We want to make sure they use the latest numbers on what uh, fracking well consumes on average. And we want to make sure that they use the latest data on what weather is going to look like over the next century. Um, typically, when our government describes um, a 100-year drought or a 25-year drought, they're using numbers that applied more to the 20th century, which is when the measurements and standards were taken. Unfortunately, due to climate change, there are going to be differences in the amount of precipitation this region receives. So we want to make sure they use the latest data. Then lastly, we would love to see them look at the rates that they are charging. Uh, currently, frackers are paying a bulk rate and are actually paying less per gallon than a household because they consume it in large amounts. We would rather that the rates were designed based on the fact that a household returns water to the watershed and a fracking operation can't. So we're kind of looking at the difference between renting something and owning it. Um, so here are some options for expressing your opinions to your local government. Um, there are public meetings of the Municipal Authority of Westmoreland County. The next one is February 21st, 2024 at noon at 124 Park and Pool Road, New Stanton, PA, 15672. 
If you don't want to memorize that, you're welcome to take a picture of this slide. We also have handouts over there. I don't, do, do we have any left? Okay. Um, yeah, they'll be emailed. So if you want this information in writing, make sure you sign up over there uh, and we will email you. Um, the other option, so mock is what's called, a, they, they have a what's called a project that is defined by the county. The county basically gave them the legal power to exist under state law. Um, they can define what mock's project is. And if they pass an ordinance that says mock needs to behave in X, Y, or Z way, that would hold legal weight. Um, so you can also go to Westmoreland County Commissioner meetings. The next one is February 8th, 2024 at 10 a.m. at Commissioner's Public Meeting Room, Courthouse Square, Greensburg, PA 15601. Um, so both of those are places that you can express your opinions on this and other issues. So we are going to shift now into a Q&A or just a free-form discussion. We're happy to answer questions, but also it's okay if you just have an opinion you want to state, if you want to vent, um, if you want to say everything's fine, that's fine too. Um, like really, there's no wrong opinions here. Uh, we have also put our contact information. That's me there. These are our friends from Three Rivers Waterkeeper. That's Jillian. This is James Cato. He couldn't be here tonight. He's with Mountain Watershed Association. And... Um, this is a link if you use your phone and you take a picture of this, it will take you to a petition online. Uh, remember we had those four requests of mock. The petition lays those out in very clear language. Um, so if you are interested in signing that, this is a way you can do it from your phone. Um, and there are also, Brendan is holding up hard copies over there, which you can sign on your way out. Um, so please be sure to see Brendan as you go. And with that, I'd like to open the floor to the public. I'm going to bring you the microphone so that folks in the recording can hear. I'm surprised you didn't mention about the water authority selling water to other municipalities. Because that's green in the reservoir as well. Yeah, there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of uses that drain the reservoir. Um, I am not a water policy expert broadly. I'm a fracking waste expert, so I'm just trying to stay in my lane here. But yes, there are a lot of a lot of issues, and if you want to express concerns about that to mock, um, the I can always pull the slide with the meeting data back up. Yeah, I'm gonna go to that meeting, but Morello is one of them. They mm -hmm. it's cheaper to buy water from our water authority than update their equipment. Mm -hmm. There's something wrong with that. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, please. Where's the clicker? Uh, it's right there. All right. Yeah, so I think that's a really good point. Um, I also want to mention, actually, um, our friends at Mountain Watershed um, alerted me to uh, other reservoirs and other um, waterways are, are getting water from Mach 2. There was actually an emergency order for Raccoon uh, Creek State Park to get water from mock. So this is not just a, um, you know, a, a problem with our region. This drought issue is, is a very regional issue. And so I just wanna make mention of this map here. Um, this is our, our map, it's on our website. Um, if you go to our, our work on our website, this is a fracking map you'll be able to pull up. So this, we work in Westmoreland and Allegheny and uh, Eastern Allegheny County. Uh, this has all of the permits, all the current fracking well permits uh, for those two counties. Now, we, uh, if you know anything about fracking, you know that it's not just these counties that fracking is happening in, but these are the ones we work in. So that's why I wanted to show it because when when uh, Tom was talking about the the future use, what will the future hold? Um, I, I have a feeling we're going to continue to see more and more drought. We're going to see more expansion of of um, you know residences, more people using the water. Um, but we're also going to be seeing more people, more companies using the water, and more fracking wells being fracked. Um, and so that that to me is is a big problem. And so. Um, you know, it's not just this region. It's not just Mach that's having this issue. It's a lot of waterways that are having this issue. So it's it's a, uh, and Tom brought up the map of the different counties. I think that is, is it here, Tom? There. Yeah. Yeah. Did so. you have a follow-up thought, sir? She displays over here. I don't oh. know if it's related to what you said, though. So if yours is still related, you can go ahead. 
Oh, I'll go ahead then. Um, so I grew up in Salzburg, which is just right outside of the one part of Beaver Run. And um, I posted something to Facebook about this right after because I was horrible when I drove home for Christmas. And, you know, the conspiracy is posting, but there is a lot of talk about the fracking companies did not actually stop drawing from the reservoir. And I'm wondering if there's any hard and fast data about that. And if there's any way for the municipality or the and mock, is that what you guys are calling it, to actually kind of um, find or like watch them to, you know, how, how can they monitor their usage? Um, because I heard it from more than one person and they weren't all crazy loons. So I'm wondering about that. So it has been really difficult to try to get the data on exactly what's happening between mock and DEP. Um, so there is supposed to be a lot of recording happening. Um, and we have done a series of right to know requests to get that information. Yeah, so so we have some of it. I don't know if we have all of it. And, and this certainly doesn't account for um, other withdrawals, but um, but this is, we, we can only report the data that is being reported to mock and is being reported to DEP. So that's as far as we can go, as far as, and we just want to deal in, in facts and right, that's what, yeah. I would love to have some sort of facts yeah. for when people are like, oh, that's not the problem. It's that there was no snow or, yeah. you know, oh, the problem is that they sold to too many municipalities. Like why isn't they, like I, I would, I wanted to have more facts. Yeah. yeah. I think it's probably a multitude of, of okay. issues combined. I mean, and it's not just the fracking issue. There are other industries that use water, but those industries use it and it and it can be it can go back into the water system whereas fracking our point is fracking cannot once once you contaminate it for it can no longer be used for human consumption in the future Where does it go then i, I hate to be yes. well I'm yes it, of it. I'm yeah no it's not it's it's that's what we're here to educate for out in the ground so they put it into an, they put it into injection wells yeah do you guys know what an injection well is how many people know what an injection well is I know a couple people do. Okay. Yeah. All right. Good. Good. So, yeah, an injection well is a well, an old, and and they're using a lot of old conventional wells, which is, scares the crap out of me. But that's another issue. So they're using um these wells that are no longer producing gas, and they are putting the water, the produced water, down in the ground, uh, hoping that it stays trapped down there. Um, and they're the one that we're actually um, fighting uh, the 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 expansion of is in Plumborough, and um, we yeah so we've been fighting really hard to, because that one is very close to the Allegheny River, and should the casing fail again because it's it's failed once before, um, per our instructions we asked DEP not to uh, permit the well. They did anyway. We told them that it would fail. It failed anyway. And so um, they they did recase it, but we're just waiting and hoping that it doesn't fail again. Um, and and that that's what an injection well is. It basically the waste gets trucked off the site into one of these wells. It doesn't just stay in Pennsylvania. It goes to DEP, uh, it goes to to Ohio, some goes to West Virginia, some goes to New York, it goes all over the place. Can I add something? Uh, I, I, I found the Fayette. So we 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 worked on a. Uh, there was an injection well that was proposed in Fayette County, uh, not that far from Falling Water. Um, and um, one of the concerns with injection wells in general is that I think people think when you put something underground, you can forget about it. You know, it's like it's like putting garbage under your rug or something. Um, but it is like putting garbage under your rug. It's still there. Um, and it's going to cause you problems. Um, so the um, the issue in Fayette County, for example, was that our analysis identified that there were um, abandoned wells, gas wells in the vicinity uh, that were close enough that they might be able to communicate with it. And one of them appeared to perforate an abandoned coal mine, which in turn ran under the Monongahela River about 80 feet below its course. So, you know, we can't prove that it would definitely contaminate the drinking water of 25 million people, but it seems like the burden of proof ought to be on the company to prove that it doesn't. And it's it gets very scary with some of these proposals because our ground is perforated with these wells. We have been having gas drilling since the 1880s. Um, so um, 
you know, you're you're right to think about this from a bigger perspective than just how does fracking impact the drought. Where the water goes after that is a very big issue as well. Um, does anybody else have any thoughts they'd like to share? About a week ago in the paper, there was a letter to the editor and possibly can help me with, when I read it, it stated that the water company was sold to a private company. You feel that they are a private company or? You mean Mog? Yeah. Yes. I hadn't heard anything about that. I, I don't. I, I my yeah. my understanding. Would you like to? I'm sorry. So, uh, we're from the municipal authority. Um, Take the microphone. Yeah, I'm. So, I'm sorry to put you on the spot. I just don't That's want okay. to give the wrong information. Yeah, we're from the municipal authority. Um, we are publicly chartered. Um, there's nothing private. Okay, sorry. I was just, I didn't want to haul her into the microphone. Um, I'm from the municipal authority. My name is Matt Junker. Um, thanks for having us. Um, we're here to listen, but um, we are public. Um, the commissioners charted us in 1942, um, and they appoint our board members. Um, we do have a uh, contracted management company, but we are in no way private. I'm sorry to put you on the spot. I just, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, this is a general question to uh, the slide on the bottom of page three where it talks about the depletion of the water supplies. Um, what what uh, do the drilling companies attribute the, uh, the great increase in the number of gallons required to drill uh, a well? That's a very interesting question. Uh, I don't know the answer off the top of my head. Yeah, I guess it would be a custom one. Yeah. yeah. I believe it has to do with that, but I don't have a solid answer for that. When I was pulling information for this specific slide, as I saw, I was like, well, why is there such an increase in the amount of water used? Imagine how many. Yeah, and that's where I'm like, Jillian has an answer. Yeah. So, so back when fracking started happening, so I, I don't know if anybody knows what fracking is, um, but you drill down and then you drill what's called a lateral. So they turn the drill bit and they drill across, okay? So back in the day when they first started fracking, they were drilling about a mile lateral. Now, in order to, um, you know, they say conserve impact for communities, okay, so there's the thinking less impact and that they can go further, is they drill further. So now some of these Gen 2 and Gen 3 wells are two, three miles or more. Okay, so they're drilling longer laterals. And so the fracking, fracking takes an enormous amount of water, chemicals, and sand, and they shove it down the hole at very high pressure so, so that, that they can fracture the shale rock. So imagine the pressure it would take to, to, to fracture this rock. Okay, and that's and that's how um, they're able to frack, and that releases the gas. The water comes back up in the sand space called propent, and it stays down there to prop open those fissures. And only, but but the Marcella shale is is like a sponge, and so only about um, you know two to five percent, depending on who you ask, uh, comes back up from the well, and that's called produced water. But the estimate used to be three to five million gallons per well. But I've heard estimates of 10 to 15 million gallons per well. And it just really depends on how far they're going in that lateral. That depends on how much water they need to get the pressure to be able to fracture the rock. Is 20 wells per pad? It can, you can go up to 20 um, wells per pad. Now, I've seen super pads um, that are proposed that have more than 20 on them. Um, so a pad is typically about five to seven acres. Um, and they start out with one or two, they see how the production is, uh, and then they usually add more. And there are several in Penn Township that have over 10 wells per pad. So it's, it's very common to have several. And what they're now doing is um, they're drilling multiple wells in, on the top hole, and they're going deeper. So the Marcellus is here, the Utica is below the Marcellus, so that's even deeper. So that also impacts how much water, because the further they have to go, the more water they need to take up to that pressure. I also wanted to add, like, 
this slide specifically too. So this data and information was taken from Track Tracker, and this data is from Frac Focus. And so these numbers are accurate, but it's also noted that for Frac Focus, that's self-reporting data from them to them. And so it is noted that there's information that's still not there. And so that's where we really want to go into that thing Oh, in fact, and that's where this comes from. But so we won't speculate. But I also did want to add that there was there's some holes in yeah. that. So. And so what he's saying is this is industry reported data. So we can only give you what's reported. And so that is reported by. Uh, yeah. So thank you for that. So the second question uh, concerning page seven on the the. Uh, the strategies, I guess, being that we have folks from the water authority here, I mean, you know, what would be like a general timeline, you know, for them to act and or make a decision on these types of, uh, you know, uh, suggestions that you've you've listed? Well, I haven't talked to them about it yet. They're hearing about it for the first. I actually told them I wouldn't put them on the spot tonight. I'm sorry about that. I just didn't want didn't know how to answer that question. Um, so I don't want to hold them to a timeline. Uh, I, I think that tonight is intended to be the opening of a conversation. Um, and my hope is that some of you folks will go to these meetings and talk with them more um, uh, about your concerns, and we can start having, you know, uh, we, we can start working out how to implement some of them and whether some of them are going to need ordinances or others can be just done as mock policy, which is very much going to affect whether they can be done and how quickly. So at least the meetings for the county, the county commissioner's meetings are every month. So, and I don't know if the mock meetings are every month. Are they every month? Every month. So if you don't make it this month, you can make it next month or the month after. So this is, uh, I think, uh, um, you once said this is a sprint, or this is a marathon, not a sprint. sprint. Yeah. So, and we hope that this is the beginning of the conversation, and we hope that you bring this information back to your friends and neighbors um, so that they may engage in this process. And that we have lots of different educational programs. So this is only one of many um, that we provide to the community just to try to make sure that everyone has the facts and has the information that they need. Because um, oftentimes we find that the more facts that people have, the less scared they are <laughs> when something happens to their community. I'll bring it over to you. Hi there. I just have a quick comment um, about the injection. I wish I brought my copy of Popular Science, but I didn't bring it with me to introduce the fact that um, injection wells can cause earthquakes. And uh, Oklahoma has been shaking for quite a number of years because of the injection wells that are going on in Oklahoma because the high pressure they use to inject that water back into the ground can cause the earth to shake. Uh, this is not just limited to just plum where there's an injection well. I mean, it's, it's going to shake regardless of where this, this is. So that's why it's important that we all fight for this um, injection well to stop yeah that is that is in, that is true information uh, the um the thing about injection wells is that they are much higher pressure even than a fracking well um which is why it's scary as jillian mentioned earlier when an old fracking well is repurposed as an injection well because it wasn't originally drilled with that intention the casing isn't thick enough to maintain the pressure uh as to keep it where it needs to be um, so that is true. The, the pressure can cause seismic activity from an injection well. Um, who else has a uh, comment or a question? I'll yeah, please. Um, first, are the meetings always at noon? Be okay. Regular time. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Work. <I know>. Uh, <laughs> it makes it hard for us working people. Yes. Um, uh, second, just so that I understand the reasons possibly for beaver run in, in particular what i heard said and i just want to make sure i'm hearing right is uh weather drought caused by what drought caused by weather um overuse of the water whether it's sold to other um places and then was the frack and possibly that the fracking were you saying that the fracking wasn't stopped during the voluntary that, and that was one of the action items was to ask them to 
yeah, stop so, sooner? Yes. So so you're 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 remembering correctly. Um one of our requests is that anytime a drought watch or warning is declared for Westmoreland County or statewide, that fracking automatic fracking withdrawals automatically be paused. Currently, they did pause it, um, but it wasn't right when the uh, drought watch was declared. Um, now, m much of the use took place before the drought watch, which is why our other recommendations concern the regular use of fracking water. Because you know, when it's when it's raining, we're always going to be headed for the next drought. There's always going to be another drought. We need to be planning for that drought proactively, even when times are good. Did you have something else? Um, no, I well, I did, but now I can't. Remember. Okay, that's fine. We can come back to you. Right. And my question was just around the the drought when when you're showing the the um, map of PA, is that drought measured by as much rainfall and snow that we have, or is the takeaways from everybody, including industry, driving the fact that it's a drought? The question is about what defines a drought statewide. Mm -hmm. Um, drought conditions, when does the EP declare a drought watch? Oh. I think we have a slide on that towards the beginning. Why <clears throat> are we nation entering into the world of droughts and everything is a bit new for us, and so I don't want to give the wrong answers, but definitely the hiding of the Do you still have a copy of the drought conditions plan on the website? Yeah. Am I to give? Well, these are the numbers from the drought contingency plan, uh, and those are correct for mock. The, the the piece of the puzzle that I, that we don't know the answer to off the top of our heads is statewide. What are the criteria? Um, which is it what's yeah, falling yeah. or what's being drawn? I think it's off, I think it's I think it's based on precipitation, but I don't want to give you a wrong answer. Okay. So we can include we can look into it and maybe include it in the follow up email. Uh, just a quick question. Um, if fracking companies uh, don't withdraw water from the reservoir, where are they going to get the water from? Yeah, right. <laughs> no, that's it's always it's always a concern. You know, we have this issue a lot with fracking on on other issues as well. When we talk about, for example, setting up setbacks of a certain distance away from homes or schools or daycares. Um, people say, don't you know the industry is just going to find ways to continue to frack? They're just going to use their existing sites, or they're just going to use, um, you, you know, they're they're going to drill more laterals from the same uh, from the same borehole. Um, and that's all true. And you know, that's up to the industry to figure out their workarounds around how we try to do good public policy. Um, what we do know is that the levels they're currently withdrawing it from Beaver Run are unsustainable, and perhaps. If we instituted uh, reasonable caps on their use, um, they would need to be a little more thrifty with it. I, I, I'm not an industry person. I can't tell you. I think your instinct that they would find a way to get water is probably correct. Um, but my hope is that we would encourage them to conserve. You know, right now, most of the... Um, it, it, you know, you'll you'll hear about these conservation orders and it'll be like you can't water your vegetable garden or you know and and I don't really think that that is the primary driver of consumption um so anyway yeah that, that's a long answer it's kind of a hedge like they will find a way um but hopefully it's not as wasteful as the way they currently do it um yes I travel 66 north mm -hmm. and the other year there was a big Everyone said it was a pipeline from Beaver Run. Uh, we heard it was going to a pad. Is that what was going on? Yes. So, I mean, there are several pipelines uh, that that go from Beaver Run to um, different pads. And actually, in Penn Township, I think there are two or three um, uh, taps, so they can just tap right in. Um, and you'll see if you go, uh, we don't have the pictures up here, but <laughs> um, you can see they they fill up these big swimming pools because they can only fill up so much per day. So they fill up this giant swimming pool on, on the pad um, and they usually do it from a tap or they can do it from, there's actually this Kratos water line that the DEP just approved um, that we were hoping to make comments on before it was approved because we were concerned not only about the drought, but also about 
um, any aquatic life or or and also the company that was putting in the line um, has has um, uh, over 700 violations currently with the DEP. So um, that means that they've violated different sections of the Clean Air, Clean Water Act uh, over 700 times. So, you know, we feel like maybe some better engineering should be uh, at play here when we're proposing these things so close to our drinking water source. Um, and I would say, you know, we're humans. We need we need water to to drink. Um, we cannot live without water to drink. Um, can we live without gas? We can find alternatives um, and we can conserve what we have so we don't need to to access that much right now um, so we can have it for longer term. And so I think conserving is maybe the the word of the day, <laughs> conserve, um, conserve the water, conserve the gas. Um, and so we can, we can live and be healthy humans, right? To, uh, um, real quick to add to that, to the gentleman's point who, who spoke earlier, you know, if there was to be less fracking in this area, what would it mean for energy security is something that we get asked a lot. Um, and I like to remind people that 76% of the gas that's extracted from the ground here does not stay in Pennsylvania. And the bulk of it is exported to Europe. Um, so that is for private profit. Um, and actually, as far as our energy security, I would think we would want to store it for, again, for a rainy day in the future. And the cheapest place to store it is where it is underground. So um, if they withdraw the water slower, if they frack at a slower rate, um, it just means we'll have more there in 10 years. Um, and I will go over here. Is it, I, you mentioned at one point how many houses were in Vandergriff. How many yes. was that? 2,300 houses. Yes. And the... Yes, and this is back of the envelope math that I did based on the average consumption of a household, which is 400 gallons a day for a family of four. Uh, I don't have the precise numbers out of Vandergrift, so I wouldn't print it as a headline, um, but as an average, I'm pretty confident in it. Um, mm -hmm. Why can't they just recycle the water if it's already radioactive? Why don't they, why do they need to keep re- they, I, I think they actually do. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so so it can be recycled up to a certain point. Um, once it gets once it gets once it gets too contaminated, it can no longer be recycled um, because what comes up from the hole is not just water; it's other stuff too. Um, so what you're left with when you're done the fracking process is something is water, and they actually have what's called an OG seventy one. It's it's a plan that they um, that the operator can uh, that they can um, uh, um, it not treat, but um, uh, manipulate the water. So basically sorting the water from the solids at the, at the pad. And so there's solids, uh, the solids are the drill cuttings, the solids are the rock, you know, everything that's down in the ground that came up. Then the, you have the liquid, then you have the propent, like I said, the sand, then you have the chemicals. Um, and this is known as slick water fracking. So it's lots of, uh, it's detergents, it's um, uh, other other constituents, um, um, pesticides, herb, uh, or not pesticides, herbicides and um, biocides, uh, lubricants, things like that. So to, to keep the, the well clean, um, so the so the gas that comes up is as clean as it possibly can. So all of that is in this water. And so they they do try to separate it as best as they can so then they can use the water again at other pads. But um, that there is something in between the solid and the liquid, and that's the sludge. Um, and that actually gets solidified sometimes with sawdust, sometimes with um, coal ash or other additives. Um, and this is all in the DEP's, the DEP's plan that they submit to the DEP. Um, and yeah, and that gets put into our landfills. So um, that's going into the landfill, which causes another whole issue that we could talk about for another time. Yep. Gentleman behind me said, if they don't use the water out of Beaver Run, where would they get their water? Why couldn't they use it on the two lakes or within 10 mile Beaver Run Dam? They are water control dams. They could hold a, more water in their dams and let it out before they get flooded instead of using our drinking water. Yes. Yeah. Okay. They're both fed by big water streams coming into them. Okay. Beaver Run is a very, the, the streams going in 
they must have an awful lot of them because there is no large stream going into Beaver Run Dam. They're all small. Yeah, seven. I think there's seven. There's yeah. seven streams that feed Beaver Run Reservoir. That's, and and that's all I have. Oh, okay. Where are streams going into? Well, we can put this map on our website. This is actually, so we've been trying to gather data from DEP on, on where these companies are withdrawing. So we can see, right? Um, and, and it also gives the totals of how much they can withdraw. So this map, we, we just uh, finished based on our right to know requests we got back today. And we're happy to put it on our website. And as the, the more data we get, we're happy to, to add it. But what you're saying is why can't they get it from other places? Well, they definitely do get it from other places. They get well, it from a that. lot of different places. I, I don't know if they get it from exactly where you're talking about, but if we are able to, we can put this map on our website and you could zoom in to see exactly where they're getting. So get all the way to the back now. So you mentioned um, that some of the companies involved have 700 violations. Is there any process in place for the DEP or the EPA to shut down those companies and allow more responsible ones in? I would have a field day with that. Um, it, so, the, 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 so the question for folks who couldn't hear was, uh, some of these companies have more than 700 violations. Um, I can think of two off the top of my head that do. One of them is Olympus, which is drawing from this reservoir. That's correct, by far. Um, so unfortunately, uh, enforcement actions are fairly rare. Um, most of the violations tend to be seen as clerical errors or technical, uh, relating to paperwork. They're really not going to pay any kind of fine for that. And when they do, when they, uh, usually the penalty for a violation is it goes up on the DEP website. Sometimes they're forced to correct it. Uh, it depends a lot on the kind of violation. Um, it's rare for a fine to be issued that is a serious impediment to doing business. DEP sees, well, I, I don't want to speculate. It, 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 it appears that the enforcement actions taken by DEP to a company are just written into their budget as a line item. Um, I can add to that. Yeah. Um, so every single time there's a new well pad that's proposed in our community, we write a comment to DEP saying, did you know that this company has X amount of violations? They should know because we got the data from their website. So it's their data that we're getting. Um, and so they should know. However, the permit is still issued. And that is one of our biggest beefs mm -hmm. that, you know, don't let habitual offenders keep doing business. Uh, that is a huge beef that I have with DEP. And actually in 2022, um, then uh, Attorney General Josh Shapiro, now he's our governor, um, he uh, had a grand jury um, look, examine the impact of fracking in Pennsylvania. And one of the big issues that they found uh, that grand jury of Pennsylvanians that listened to, to hundreds and hundreds of hours of testimony of other Pennsylvanians that have been experiencing this, this issue for the last decade, uh, they found that the DEP is not doing their job. And that is the biggest beef I have with the DEP. And actually earlier this week or earlier this year, or no, last year, Tom and I went to Harrisburg to talk to the DEP secretary and tell them how we felt about this. So we are trying our hardest to make sure that it's in their face, that when they issue a permit, they know exactly how many violations that they, they're they allowing this to happen. Um, and to me, when the, when the um, attorney general issued criminal charges for um, companies like Range Resources and Cabot, they should have known that they were criminals when they issued the charges because they had been doing it for a decade and the DEP had all the data that they needed to take those moves and they never did. So that's my feeling on it. <laughs> there are evidently no checks and balances on this, okay? Every truck has a manifest that they have to have. What they're hauling, how many pounds and so forth. So this thing about how much it takes for to frack a well should that should not be. They should know. Somebody knows. Let's put it that way. Somebody also knows how far they have to go to get the water. 
and naturally they're where they're drilling they want the water right from there they don't want to go i mean you can't imagine what 20 miles further means to them okay it, it is major bucks they don't care is the basic of it and the lady that talked about oklahoma we went to texas for a wedding and we sat with uh oil people in dallas and they told us they stopped fracking because of earthquakes that they were having in texas so if you have problems in oklahoma and you have problems in texas what is going to happen in pennsylvania with our mines being fracked under or that dam being fracked under and there are wells under that dam i know that but i also know that some of the residents around there their wells are drying up all right i think we have a comment over here question when you were shown the map of the different wells in the area was that in westmoreland county because i was curious if it showed how many wells that were around our drinking water so if you zoom in on this map, you can actually see um, uh, how many wells are around our drinking water. Um, so there are, um, I don't I don't know off the top of my head how many well pads there are very close to the reservoir, um, but there are several pads that are within several hundred feet of the reservoir's edge. Um, and actually on our website, um, Brendan, who is one of our newest uh, staff member to come on board, just updated the incident the incident tracker we have on our website and and mock provides that information on their website um, to be able to report the incidents and uh, so we get we get emails when those incidents are reported and we we can um, tell the, the folks around according to wikipedia there's 100 shallow and 41 deep okay 41 deep and 100 shallow Thank according you. to wikipedia right. if you believe Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, um, so uh, another thing um, when I was doing this I was going through the reports that were on was on Mock's website um, it appears to, to me and correct me if I'm wrong and if you went out there and studied them yourselves they seem to be reported by the companies themselves the um, the gas companies themselves and the gas companies have every incentive to minimize what what their what actually happened in fact the incidents were occurring of like small amount really small amounts that may may not even been caught which is either really great or or really bad with either they're either they're not reporting it correctly or that's really great that they were able to catch that like they were that one of them had like 25 like 25 ounces that that's an extremely small amount that could have fallen out fallen out of a truck without driving down the road and nobody notice i mean I'm not saying that I don't want to accuse anybody of anything when I don't don't have much, but there's that. Who else has questions? Uh, could I make a comment? Uh, full disclosure: I'm in the in the industry. Okay, and could you put up your data about water withdrawal and which companies? Okay. 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 So. Just a little, this is my bottle of water. And I don't buy bottled water. I drink it from mock. And I use less containers. Okay. When you look at the data, overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly do the most withdrawal. Okay. I don't know because I haven't looked at the data sets. But it'd be curious to know who's doing a lot of recycling and who's not. OK, and that could account for some of this data. If we're going to have a conversation, you should reward the people who are doing a lot of recycling. Right. And maybe motivate people to do more recycling. So don't use as much water. Right. And that, that's part of the conversation. And that's work worth working for towards solutions, because it's remarkable to me to, to see the discrepancies there. OK. And looking in the industry, I know how much the, each one of these companies is drilling. And that's a remarkable discrepancy, right? Something for you all to look at. 
definitely will. Thank you for that. Um, go ahead, Mr. Speaker. I wanted to answer the young man's question there. Um, <clears throat> Dwayne, um, uh, yeah, so Dwayne, Dwayne, our source water protection specialist writes those reports. Thank you. All right. Yeah. And actually, there are source water protection meetings. Now, how often do those happen? Is it once a quarter? No. Twice a year? I know I went to the last one. <laughs> I don't remember. It's an annual meeting. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. But um, but I think the the where you're really going to talk to the people that are in charge are those board meetings, right? Am I right? Those board meetings. So the board meetings is where you can find the people that are making the decisions. All right. What other questions? Go ahead. Um, I'm just wondering, been in the area for three years. Today is the first day I've heard about this. So I'm curious how you're getting the word out. I mean, it said there are 122,000 households and there's about 50 of us here. So that's like 50 of a half million people. We can't have much impact like this. So how are you communicating it to the community? Yeah. So we communicate multiple ways. We actually sent over 5,000 texts out to the community. So if you got a text from us, that was Kiara. <laughs> she sent 5,000 of those texts. Um, and we also are posting everything on social media. Um, there is no way for us, we're a small nonprofit, for us to be able to put out to the entire community a letter or something like that. Um, so we have a website, we have social media, we have texting, we have lots of different resources at our, at our disposal, but it only goes so much. Um, and a lot of times there's so much noise in our, in our, you know, lives that we miss important things sometimes. So I would encourage everybody that's here to talk to their neighbors, to talk to their friends, to talk to their, um, their family, uh, and, and find out if they're concerned as well. Um, and then uh, let have them go to our website. They can sign the petition uh, with all the asks that Tom was talking about. We will take it to mock board. We will take it to the county commissioners and we will ask them to implement these new rules. Um, and that's the only thing that we can do. Um, but that's not to say that that's not empowering because it is. <laughs> we all have the power. So if you think that your voice doesn't matter, it absolutely does. So. I think she was first, and then I'll get back to you. Go ahead. Yeah, I was. I was just curious, you know, especially with the the fracking happening like on site at the reservoir. How how are we making sure that there's no contamination in the water, um, especially given that so many of the chemicals used in the process are proprietary and not necessarily reported? So, just kind of curious if if we know anything about that. Question was how do we know about the fracking in the immediate area of the reservoir? How do we know that that isn't contaminating the drinking water that we rely on? Yeah. So um, Mock had contracted for a while. I don't know if they're still contracted uh, IUP um, to do sa sampling. Actually, one of our interns uh, was also interning, interning at IUP to, to, to test the water. Um, so there are folks that are testing the water. Um, Mock has um, testing uh, at their facility. We actually did, there's a 125 page paper on our website uh, where we examined what they're testing for, what they're not testing for. And we made a set of recommendations to do more testing um, because we know that some of these, you know, many of these chemicals are, are non-disclosed. There are also efforts to uh, have those chemicals disclosed because, you know, knowledge is power. The more we know about what's going into the water, the, the better we can we can say no. Because I see their general reports that mm -hmm. have like how much different like known chemicals or like, yeah. But again, if we don't really know. And that is that's actually one of the challenges we currently have is to um, with a couple of what a couple of the well pads. Um, to get the companies to disclose these chemicals. And it, it is hard. It's hard. There's, yeah. All right. So this is a question about the um, injection wells. I'm trying to better understand how. So if I was understanding this correctly, so after the fracking process, they capture that wastewater. And then do they, t they truck that 
to a, an injection well site. So in order to protect like the water table, are they putting, they're putting some kind of sleeve or something into the old injection well, a concrete casing of some sort? Uh, the one in Plum, the case, the original casing was from the 80s, which is one of the reasons why we said um, our, one of our experts, uh, Dr. Tony and Grafia, uh, from Cornell University, uh, he is an engineering expert, um, and he said this old casing will fail. And we wrote to the to government, we wrote to um, to uh, the the governor, and we said don't permit this. They did anyway, and sure enough, the casing failed within a couple months after they started injecting. So, does anybody know what a uh, has anybody seen a, a residual waste tank? Anybody know what a residual waste tank is? A tanker truck. If it says residual waste on the side, that could be fracking waste and they're everywhere, okay? Um, that could have toxic radioactive waste in it. We don't know because it's not properly labeled. There is a, there is a federal law that is a, a, a loophole exemption for oil and gas industry um, that's from the 70s. It's called RICRA. And um, it allows them to classify their waste as non-hazardous, even though it is absolutely hazardous. Um, and that we have other efforts actually, that's why Tom is on our staff because we, there are a lot of efforts we're making to try to get some type of tracking from cradle to the grave, all of the waste that's being generated because it's not just the liquid waste, it's also the solid waste. So those sleeves, periodic inspections that are done to make sure that there's no separation or tracking or well, um, they they can tell from the pressure. They actually have what are called monitoring wells. Um, unfortunately, uh, one of our one of our consultants let us know that the monitoring well at the at the bomb injection well was not in the correct spot. It should have been um, lower uh, in in on the area. Um, but they do have monitoring wells, and the monitoring wells are supposed to, if something were to happen. They, they actually, water will come up from the other well. And so they'll know based on that. Um, what, and that's, and, and also loss of pressure. So that's how they knew the casing failed the first time. Can I add to that a little bit? That, that exact scenario happened in Fayette County. Or we were talking earlier about uh, the proposed injection well there. They did a, the company in that case did a test of the well they wanted to use and that showed a pressure drop, which means something cracked underground. However, in order to test it, you don't need the same rigorous level of permitting. You actually have to do the tests to go to EPA to get the permit, which means that some waste was injected and it leaked and we only know about it. Like the only way to find out if there's a problem is to create a problem. You know what I'm saying? Like there's no way to know in advance if one of these things is going to fail. Uh, there's a woman back there. Oh, I thought you raised your hand. I'm sorry. Jillian, correct me if I'm wrong on this too. Um, we've been trying to get a hold of like all the chemicals that they actually use to, to frack a well. And uh, some of that, they call it just fracking mud. And it's like a slurry of things. And they, they say they have a patent on it. I keep that a secret. So we don't even know all of the chemicals that they use to do this. Is that right? There are, you can go to Frack Focus. That's a website you can go to um, where it has the chemicals listed on there. And this is self-reported, again, data from directly from the industry. They uploaded their data to Frack Focus. Um, and, but it's it'll say proprietary blend, which means that they don't have to disclose everything that's in that proprietary blend. Um, I want to mention, we do want to wrap up soon because the library is going to be closing, um, but I'm going to take, I have one question. So what at a local level with the local governments, what can the local governments do or what to help? Like, Great and what question. can we ask our local yeah. governments to do? I love that question. That's what we've been trying to do for 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Go ahead. Yeah, so there, there's a, there's three things off the top of my head. And actually, this is such a good question. I hadn't even thought about it until you asked it. But a local government, although they are they do not have the ability to regulate 
mock and they do not have the ability to tell the commissioners of the county what to do, they can pass a non-binding resolution that says, we think that these four common sense steps should be taken. Um, and if you go on, uh, if you use the QR code here and go to our petition, you can just take the language from that. You can go to your municipal council members and you can say, please do these, please pass a resolution calling on mock and the county commissioners to do these four things. So that's step one. And then two other things real quick. There are two other petitions that we brought here just in case people happen to be from the right areas. One is in Penn Township, which is the home of our organization. It is a petition to call for fracking wells to be set back further away from homes, daycares, businesses, schools, inhabited structures. So that is up there on the windowsill. And if you're from Penn Township, you can sign it. If you're not, please don't sign it. They're only interested in their own residents. And the other one is in Murraysville. We have a petition calling for uh, them to rescind some leases that were improperly issued for fracking in their parks. Um, that petition is also up on, and Laura, who's raising her hand there, she can point that out to you. Um, so local governments are not powerless. Don't ever accept from any of these local official, officials that they can't do anything and the DEP is going to take care of it. There are things that they can do. And actually, um, earlier this week, <laughs> we got um, a pretty awesome ruling that said that uh, in Plum, when they were trying to expand the well, and the local government said, well, we don't think we have the power to do anything about it, so we have to permit this. Well, we took it to the court, <laughs> and they said, actually, they do have the power to do something, and now they're they're asking the, the local zoning hearing board to rethink their decision, and we're hoping that they do, and we're hoping that they deny it for the, the, the human health concerns. Um, also, I would go one step further that in addition to a non-binding resolution that local governments can make binding resolutions. They can enact ordinances. And our um, community advocate, Jim Serrano, he will look at um, your local ordinance, if you have a local ordinance, and tell you where it can be improved. And you can take that to your local government and say, I want these things done to improve the health and safety of my community and improve the health and safety of my neighbors. So that is another step that you can take. Um, so you can go to our website and find Jim's information or contact Tom or I, and we can help you. Come up to me after. Yep. Yep. We can help draw that up for your community. So there's a lot of different things you can do. And I think we, uh, I'm, I'm surprised they didn't kick us out because I think we're <laughs> supposed to be done at seven. <laughs> Thanks. Thank, Thank you, you everybody. So Thanks so much. All right. Remember on your way out, there's petitions over there. Hey. If you're in